All right, welcome to my video about the advanced derivative test review. We're going to go through each of the problems one by one and uh, see if we can make a little bit more sense of them. So problem uh, number one, sketch a graph of f prime. So we're given a graph of f. We want to graph f prime. So the first thing we want to note is, you know, where do we, and so the graph of f prime is the derivative of f. So it's talking about the, the outputs or the slopes of f. So where do we know for sure on f what the exact slopes are? And we know right here, well, that's a hard color to see, isn't it? Let's try a different one. Uh, right, let's do this color. Oh, even better, pink. We'll do pink. Right here and right here, we definitely know that the slopes are zero. So that's a min and a max. So as we come around, the tangent line is going to be horizontal at both of those places. So it looks like at an x value of, I don't know, 0.75 or so. So I'm going to come over here, put a dot right about there. And an x value of 2, we know our derivative is definitely equal to 0. All right, so then if we look at this uh, graph of f, notice that we've got negative slopes right here before that first uh, pink dot and negative slopes after the second pink dot. Between them we've got positive slopes between those two dots. Okay, And right in the middle of here, somewhere in here, I'm going to put a little, little x or a little star, is a point of inflection. So we're changing from concave up to concave down. Okay, So we're going to see where all that kind of appears over here. So because we start out with negative slopes, we're going to draw on the left side of this pink dot over here from negative infinity to that 0.75 or whatever it is. We're going to draw below the x-axis because that's indicating that our original function f has negative slopes. So here at just shy of 0, so the left side of 0, we have very, very negative slopes. So we're going to be, I mean, we're talking really, really low values down here. And then as we get closer to that 0 0.75, we're getting closer and closer, we're shallowing out, we're getting closer and closer to zero. So our graph's probably going to look something similar to this. So we start out really steep, and then we're getting closer and closer to a y value of zero. Same thing on the other side of two, except for this time we're starting off really close to zero and then getting steeper and steeper. So we're going to start off close to a y value of zero and then work our way down. So something like this, I don't know. Okay, Then in between, we have positive slopes. We're going to draw above the x-axis. And right here, that blue dot with the point of inflection that I had marked here, the change in concavity, that's where the positive slope is the steepest. So that's going to be our highest y value over here. And if we were trying to go for accuracy, we would try to figure out, you know, what is that slope? I've probably drawn this a little wrong because it looks to me like it's probably closer to like a slope of 2 or 3. But to make this nice pretty parabola here, I'm going to put this point right about there. That is the highest that we're going to get right there. So we're going to start close to 0 until we reach that blue point. So close to 0 until we reach that blue point. And then on the other side, we're going to start from that blue point and go closer to a slope of 0. And so our graph will look something like that. Um, so that is, there's our graph of f prime. What I would be really looking for is do you have this x value and that x value in generally the right place? And does your graph have generally this shape? It could be a lot steeper, you know, peaked more like that. That's kind of beyond, you know, how, how high up this goes and stuff is beyond the purpose of this problem. So something that looks like that uh, would be perfect. Okay, problem number two. We are going backwards. This time we are given a graph of g prime, so the derivative, and we want to draw a possible sketch of g. And we want to assume that g is continuous. We're not going to have any breaks uh, in continuity in our graph over here. So let's look what we got. We have, for negative infinity until 1, we have negative slopes. They are below the x-axis over here. And you'll notice they are always equal to 2. So we have negative two slopes for until I get to an x value of one. Afterwards, we have positive one slopes from one and two till infinity. So over here, now I don't know where this point's going to be. I know it's going to be someplace on this line right here. Okay, it's not an asymptote, I'm just marking that line. Okay. 
I'm going to have um, a point. I know there's going to be points somewhere. So let's get some place to start from. So let's, uh, I'm just going to put it, since I know I have to have negative slopes on the left and positive slopes on the right, I'm going to put it a little lower. I'm going to put it about right here. Okay. So let's say I definitely know that my graph passes through this point, or I want to draw my graph of G so it passes through that point. I'm going to have negative two slopes on the left of that point. So that means up two to the left one up two to the left one, up two to the left one. So you can see I've got negative two slopes until I get to that point. And after that point, I have positive one slopes, so up one over one, up one over one, up one over one. And so a slope of something that looks like that. And there's our graph of G. Notice it is continuous. I have made it so it's continuous. If I didn't have that part right there, I could have drawn this green line way up here someplace. It doesn't matter. It could have been discontinuous. Um, but this would be a graph of G. Now, your, uh, your graph could be a vertical shift of this one. So if you had not drawn this dot here, if you had drawn it up here, that would be just fine. You'd still have negative two slopes here, negative one slopes here, and that's fine. The vertical shift... Um, uh, you can't figure that out going backwards like this without having more information. Okay, problem number three. I'm going to scroll down the thing a little bit here. Let's take a look at number three. It says, what is the equation of the line tangent to the graph of g of x at this point right here? So we are trying to find the equation of a line. So I always like to start off with a little bl blueprint. So we have y minus y1 is equal to our m, our slope, times x subtract x1. And that is a blueprint for, that's the equation of a line. That's slope intercept form. Sorry, sorry not slope, point slope form. And you'll notice that we start out, they tell us a point. So here's our x1, and here is our y1. Now we just have to figure out the slope. So let's get that far first. So I've got y subtract y1, which in this case is a negative 3 halves. So it's going to be minus th negative 3 halves. So it's going to end up being a positive 3 halves is equal to our slope, which we're not sure about yet. So we'll skip that for a second. x subtract x1, so pi over 6. So this is going to be our answer. We just have to now figure out what the slope is. So we're going to take a look at this equation up here. It says g of x is equal to 3 times the cosine of 4x. We want to figure out the slope of that function at this point. That's the definition of a tangent line. A tangent line is going to have the same slope at the same point as a function. So if we find the slope of this function at that point, it's going to be the same slope for our tangent line at that point. So let's take the derivative. So g prime of x is equal to derivative of cosine is negative sine. So this is going to be negative 3 sine of 4x times the derivative of the inside, which is 4. So if you want to clean it up a little bit, we've got negative 12 sine of 4x. And we want to know what happens when we plug this point into it. So it's got an x value and a y value. You notice that our derivative only deals in terms of x. We only have to worry about the x value. So let's evaluate this. Let's do g prime evaluate. I don't like that. Back up. I'm going to do back. I'm just going to go back to red. So we're going to evaluate g prime at net pi hat pi six. Excuse me, pi six our x value. It's equal to negative twelve sine of four times pi over six. Okay. So four times pi over six is four pi six. I'm going to kind of write this over here, if that's okay. I've kind of run out of room. So I've got g prime of pi over 6 is equal to negative 12 sine of 4 pi 6, which is 2 pi thirds. Sine of 2 pi thirds, 12 times. Sine of 2 pi thirds is square root of 3 over 2. And the square root of 3 over 2 times negative 12. So g prime at pi over 6 is equal to negative 6 square roots of 3. And that's going to be our slope. So up here, I'm going to put negative 6 square root 3 is our slope. And this is the equation of our tangent line. 
to the graph of g at this point. Okay, question number four. Find the x values of all points on f where the line tangent to f has a slope of 1. All right, well, if the line tangent to f has a slope of 1, that means we're trying to find when does f have a slope of 1. So in order to find slope, let's take the derivative. So we've got f of x is equal to x cubed plus 2x squared. We want to know when does this have a slope of negative 1. So we'll do f prime of x is equal to derivative 3x squared plus 4x. I'm not look, I don't know what the x values are that will make this equal to negative 1, but I do know I want it equal to negative 1. So we're going to set this equal to negative 1 and then solve for the x values. So this will tell me what, for what x values will f be, have a slope of negative 1. Let's solve this for 0. So let's go 0 is equal to 3x squared plus 4x. Add 1 to both sides, so plus 1. We can factor that. We get 3x, x, 1 and 1, positive and positive. Uh, yep, that looks right. So we've got x is equal to a negative 1 third. That will make that equal to 0. And x is equal to a negative 1. That will make that equal to 0. So these two values make this statement up here true. Make, so if I plug in negative 1 third, I'll get a, into my derivative function. I'll get out a value of negative 1. If I plug in negative 1 into my derivative function, I will get out a value of negative 1. So find the x values. They are x equals negative 1 third and x equals negative 1. If I wanted to find the y values, I would simply take these uh, uh, x values, plug them into my original equation, because those would be the points on f. Since I'm looking at f, I'd want to find the points there, so I'd plug them into f, not f prime. And those are our answers for there. All right, problem number five it says find the absolute max and absolute min of f of x on the closed interval negative three to negative one. All right, so for this guy, let's just say I'm going to just draw a possible picture of f. Okay, this is, has nothing really to do with this problem. I'm just saying, I want to show you what we're trying to find here. So let's say f looks like, I don't know, looks something like that. Okay, and let's say that we were trying to find the absolute max and absolute min on just a portion of this graph. Because right now, if this goes down forever and that goes up forever, there is no absolute max or absolute min. So let's say I'm just trying to find the absolute max and min from, let's say, this point right here. Okay, all the way up to this point right here. Okay, so between those two points. Okay, and just looking at this graph, I um, have a local max right here, a local min right here, and a local max right here. Now my actual absolute min is this point right here, and my absolute max is that point right here. So what this diagram illustrates is our absolute maxes and mins they could be relative extrema, okay, or they could be our endpoints. So really all we're trying to do is figure out, hey, what are my possible x values? What are my possible x values for all of these points? And which one spits out the highest value? That's going to be my absolute max. And which x value spits out the lowest value, which will be my absolute min? So that's kind of what we're trying to go for. Remember, this is not a graph of this right here. Don't try graphing that on your calculator. That's not, that's not what it looks like. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. So find the absolute max. So first of all, what we've got to do, we need to find the derivative of this. We need to find out when is my derivative going to have, when, or should I should say, when is our f function going to have maxes or mins? And to do that, we need to take the derivative. So we're going to find the derivative of f gives us negative 3x squared minus 8x minus 4. Then I want to know when is this ever undefined or when is this ever equal to 0 because that could be where that would be where our maxes and mins would have to be is either when this is undefined or when it is equal to 0. So first off let's take a look at undefined. This is a quadratic equation. It's a polynomial. Polynomials are never undefined. There's no division going on, no square roots or anything like that. So this is not going to ever be undefined, but it might be equal to 0. So let's see. If I set it equal to 0, let's see if we can solve for this thing. 
Um, I don't like quadratics that are negative, so I'm going to factor out that negative, make life a little bit easier. And then you can factor. You can use the quadratic formula if you know how to do completing the square. You can use that uh, if you're crazy. I don't like that method. Um, but I just like factoring it. So we've got 3x and x. Uh, 2 and 2 will do it. So we've got, we're going to work 2 and 6. Yep, that's going to work. So we're going to have x equals negative 2 thirds. That will make this equal to 0. And x equals negative 2 would make this one equal to 0. Those two values are when our derivative is going to end up equaling 0. So back to our little diagram over here. I need to check the y values for f at any x value where the derivative is equal to 0. That's these pink places. And my uh, endpoints. Those are my red places. So I have to check all those. So here I've got two endpoints, negative 3, negative 1. So I need to check those. So I'm going to say f of negative 3. I want to know what that is equal to. And I want to check f of negative 1 and see what that is equal to. Let me scroll down a little bit. We don't need all that other stuff up there. So here we go. I want to see what that is equal to. I also want to check my possible maxes and mins inside that interval. Now, if you look carefully, negative 3 to negative 1, negative 2 thirds is a bigger number than negative 1. It's on the right of this interval. I don't need to check this one because it's not in my interval. I do need to check negative 2, though, because it is in my interval. So I do need to check negative 2. So I'm checking my endpoints and checking my extrema, possible extrema, that exist in that interval. And I'm just plugging them into the original equation. So let's take a negative 3. So if I plug negative 3 in, we got negative, negative 3 cubed minus 4 times a negative 3 squared minus 4 times a negative 3 subtract 1. Negative 3 squared is negative 27. So that becomes positive 27. Negative 3 squared is positive 9 times negative 4 is negative 36. Negative 4 times negative 3 is positive 12. And then subtract 1. So 27 plus 12 is 39. 39 subtract 36 is 3. 3 subtract 1 is 2. So we plugged in negative 3. We got out a value of 2. And remember, we're looking for our highest value and lowest values here. So now let's check number negative 1. So negative, one, negative, negative 1 cubed times a negative 4. Negative 1 squared minus 4 times a negative 1 subtract 1. We got negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1, times a negative makes it positive 1. Uh, negative 1 squared is positive 1, times a negative 4 is negative 4. Negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4. That's nice, those are going to cancel out. And subtract 1. Oh, how about that? They all cancel out. So that's equal to 0. So, so far, this guy right here is my absolute max, and this guy right here is my absolute min. But let's see what happens when we plug in negative 2. So I have a negative, negative 2 cubed, minus 4 times a negative 2 squared, minus 4 times a negative 2, minus 1. Negative 2 cubed is negative 8, times a negative is positive 8. Uh, negative 2 squared is positive 4, times negative 4 is negative 16. Negative 4 times a negative 2 is positive 8. And subtract 1. We've got 8 plus 8 is 16. Subtract 16 is 0. Minus 1 is negative 1. So looking at this, our highest output value is actually on our endpoint at negative 3. So it says find the absolute max. So the absolute max is at, and I want the point, negative 3, comma 2. And the absolute min is at negative 2, comma, negative 1. And there's our answer. Now you'll notice in the directions it does have, you know, maximums. So if, if there had been a tie, let's say that this guy right here came out to be 0, but let's say it came out to be 2, uh, the same as this one. I would have two absolute maxes. I'd have a tie for absolute max. So I'd write them both down. I'd have two absolute maxes. Uh, that's not the case on this problem, but um, there you go. That's how you find absolute maxes and absolute mins. Problem number six, use the tangent line of f of x uh, at the point 2 comma 9 to approximate f of 2.1.
All right, so it says use the tangent line. So the first thing we gotta do is we've gotta come up with the tangent line. So let's first write our little blueprint. So we've got, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna paste this in there. There we go. All right, so there's our uh, tangent line equation. Oh, you can still see part of the stuff I kept. Get rid of it. There we go. Okay, so there's our tangent line equation. We know for this particular problem that y1 is 9, positive 9, and x1 is 2. Got to figure out our slope. So to figure out our slope, we'll take the derivative of f and evaluate it at this point. So we've got f of x is equal to that. So f prime of x is going to be 6x squared bring the next one down, it's going to be negative 7x, so minus 7x, and derivative of 7 is 0, so there's our derivative. Uh, now we want to plug in 2, 9, now there's only, this is only in terms of x, so we don't have to worry about the 2, so f prime at 2 is equal to 6 times 2 squared minus 7 times 2, which gives us 2 squared is 4, that's 24, subtract 14, which is 10, so the derivative at 2 is 10, so our slope here is 10. So we know our tangent line equation to be y minus 9 is equal to 10 x subtract 2. There's our tangent line equation. Now it wants us to use that equation and evaluate or approximate, I should say, what is happening at f of 2.1. So that's an x value. So we're going to plug 2.1 into this. So we have y subtract 9 is equal to 10 2.1 subtract 2. 2.1 subtract 2 is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 times 10 is 1. Add 9 to both sides and we get y is equal to 10. So there's our answer. Now if you were to actually plug in 2.1 into f, you would get the exact value. But we don't want the exact value on this problem. They are asking us to approximate it. So we do need to approximate it using the tangent line equation. It's very possible that one of these answers over here is the actual exact value, and if you circled that one, you would be wrong. I think 10.1 might be the actual answer if you plug 2.1 in, but I'm not sure, and I'm too lazy to check. But the correct answer for this one that I want is 10. All right, let's take a look at number 7. It says find the open intervals. That means that we're using parentheses, not brackets, so um, no endpoints on which the function f is increasing. Now we know that f is increasing when the derivative of f is positive. So what we need to do on this problem is we need to determine when f prime is positive. So first let's uh, take the derivative. So we've got f prime of x. Take the derivative of that, so it's going to be negative 2 thirds. Leave the inside alone. Subtract a whole, so subtract 3 over 3, gives us a negative 1 third. There's our derivative. Now times the derivative of the inside, which is going to be 1, right, the chain rule. We want to know when this is positive. So the best way to do that is to figure out when is this going to change from positive to negative. And the only places it will occur is if the derivative is either equal to 0 or if it is undefined. So let's check to see when this thing is going to be 0 or undefined. I'm going to rewrite it, though. When I evaluate... Um, I like to have positive exponents. When I take derivatives, sometimes having negative exponents is much easier. But evaluating, I think it's easier sometimes to see with positive exponents. So I'm bringing this guy down to the bottom. So this is f prime. It will be, e since it's a fraction, it will be equal to 0 when the numerator is equal to 0. However, there's no variable up there. It's always going to be equal to 2. This thing will never equal 0. So the, uh, the derivative itself will never equal 0. No matter what you plug in for x, it's never going to be equal to 0. The other thing we have to check is if f prime is ever undefined. Well, in order to make a fraction undefined, you have to divide by 0. And if we had an x value of negative 2, that's going to make the bottom equal to 0. And negative 2 plus 2 is 0. The cubic root of 0 is 0. 0 times 3 is 0. You get 2 divided by 0, which is undefined. So we have an issue at x equals negative, negative 2, and we call that a critical number. 
We only have one in this case. There might be more sometimes, depending on the problem. But in this one, there's only one. So x equals negative 2. This is the only candidate, the only possibly, possible place where our function f can change from increasing to decreasing, or from positive slopes to negative slopes. This is the only place it can happen. Not necessarily means it does happen there, but it's the only place that it can happen. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little chart. It's called the first derivative test. And we're going to see this little number line. Let's stick a negative 2 on there. I want to see what's happening with the derivative before negative 2. Is it positive or negative? That's the only thing I care about. Is it positive or negative? So we're going to place, we're going to pick a number smaller than negative 2 and stick it in our derivative equation and figure out if our, all we care about is the output value is positive or negative. That's all we care. So let's pick a number. Let's do negative 10. Negative 10 plus 2 is negative 8. Negative 8 cubic root of negative 8 is going to be a negative number. In fact, it's negative 2, but it's going to be negative. So I have a negative value uh, times a negative 2 thirds, so that's going to be a positive value. So we are positive on the left side of negative 2. And you could play, take any number you wanted to. You could take negative 100. It doesn't matter. You'll still come out with a positive value there. Then, let's try what ha see what happens on the other side of negative 2. So let's plug in a number bigger than negative 2, like 0. So if I plug in 0, 0 plus 2 is 2. 2 to the 1 third power. That is the cubic root of 2. Uh, cubic root of a positive number is going to be a positive number. So I have a positive number times a negative 2 thirds is going to be a negative number. Now this chart is really cool. It tells us a lot of cool stuff. First off, it tells us that the derivative is positive between, before negative 2, and it tells us the derivative is negative after uh, negative 2. But that tells us function f has positive slopes or is increasing before negative 2. It also tells us that uh, our original function f has negative slopes or is decreasing after negative 2. Since our f prime changes sign from positive to negative, it means that at negative 2, our original function f has a maximum value. Now, that's all a lot of information that we don't need for this problem, but it's kind of neat, the things that we can learn from this little chart. So answering the question says, in which, of the, uh, interval, which intervals is f increasing? Well, f is increasing when its derivative is positive. So f is increasing on the interval negative infinity to negative 2. Push hard enough. There we go. All right. So there's number seven. Question eight. Same idea, except for this time we're looking at when g is concave down. So if we're talking about concavity, this is going to be the second derivative. So we're going to do the same thing we did over here, except for instead of stopping at the first derivative, we're going to go to the second derivative. So let's first find the first derivative. So this is going to be 25x to the fourth minus 450x squared. Since we're dealing with concavity, we'll keep going. Second derivative is going to be 100x to the third minus 900x. And there's our second derivative. Uh, so if our second derivative is positive, our original function is going to be concave up. If our second derivative is negative, it's going to be concave down. So we're going to do the same thing. I want to know when, I want to find those critical numbers. When is our second derivative now undefined, or when is it equal to 0? Well, it is a polynomial, so it's never going to be undefined. There's nothing I can plug in here that will make this thing undefined. However, it is equal to 0 at a couple of places. So if I set it equal to 0, let's solve. Uh, out of these, we can pull out 100x. They're both divisible by 100x, leaving us with x squared subtract 9. Uh, this we can factor. It's a difference of squares, if that helps. So it's going to be very dark. x plus 3x minus 3. So we have three places this is equal to 0. x equals 0 at that place. x equals negative 3, and x equals positive 3. Oops. x equals positive 3. So we got 0, negative 3, and positive 3. So let's do a little chart, this time for the second derivative. It's always a good idea to write this next to it so you know uh, which equation you need to plug into. Because if we were doing the same, uh, if, I, if this question was all part of the same problem, 
I'd be doing the first derivative test and later doing the second derivative test. I wouldn't want to get those mixed up. And look at that, I even called this one f when it's supposed to be g. So there you go. Uh, g double prime. So we've got, let's put, make sure we get these in order because this is a number line. So negative 3, 0, and positive 3. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4 intervals to check. So let's first start with um, a value smaller than negative 3. I like plugging into my factored form, so this guy right here. So if I plug in a number smaller than negative 3, like negative 4, this is going to be negative. This, in fact, so I can keep track of this, this guy is going to be negative. This guy is going to be negative. And this guy is going to be negative. A negative times a negative times a negative is a negative. Although I'm now going to erase all those because I don't want all those back. So this is a negative. Then, if I plug in a number between negative 3 and 0, like negative 1, this is also going to be negative again. This is going to now be positive. This is still going to stay negative. So that makes negative times a positive times a negative is a positive. So this is going to be positive. Plug in a number between 0 and 3, 2. So that's going to be a positive. 2 plus 3 is positive. 2 minus 3 is a negative. So we have a positive times a positive times a negative. So this is going to be negative. And then finally, plug in something bigger than 3, like 100 billion. This is going to be positive. This is going to be positive. This is going to be positive, which gives us a positive answer right here. Now be careful. Some people get in the habit. They think it's always going to alternate negative, positive, negative, positive. And that's not always the case. So make sure you do check all of the intervals. Don't just assume that it's going to be right. Okay? It might even be a good idea just to double check them sometimes, make sure that they're all right. So anyways, this is asking, when is our original function g concave down? Well, it's going to be concave down when our second derivative is negative. And our second derivative is negative. So g is concave down on the intervals negative infinity to negative 3 and 0 to 3. That is when we are concave down. All right, problem number nine. If the natural log of 2x plus y is equal to x plus 1, then what is the derivative of y with respect to x? So here we go. We're just going to take the derivative, and we just have to remember that whenever we take the derivative of y, we write it as dy over dx. So here we go. So the derivative of natural log is 1 over the inside, which in this case is 2x plus y times 1 over the natural log of e, because it's base e, so it's going to be 1 over the natural log of e, so we'll, which is 1, so I'm not going to put it, times the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of 2x is 2, plus the derivative of y is dy over dx. Now, this has to get multiplied to this entire thing, so I do need to make sure I put this in parentheses equals the derivative of this side, derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of 1 is 0. So here we are. We are done with the calculus aspect of this problem. Now our goal, it says we want to find dy over dx. So we want to get the dy over dx by itself. So here it is right here inside this set of parentheses. So let's get rid of this garbage over here. Let's multiply both sides by 2x plus y. So that leaves us with 2 plus dy over dx is equal to 1 times 2x plus y, 2x plus y. Now, these parentheses aren't really doing anything anymore, so we could just subtract 2 from both sides, and we get dy over dx is equal to 2x plus y subtract 2. Problem number 10, same idea. Whoa, that's crazy. A little carried away. Uh, is same idea. We're taking the uh, derivative of this with respect to x, so we just have to remember if we take the derivative of something other than x, we write it as, such as y, and we take, write it as dy over dx. So the derivative of x is 1. The derivative of negative y is negative derivative of y, which is dy over dx. So far, so good. Ah, then here, so plus, I'm going to put a plus sign. We have two functions. I'm going to break them up like this. I'm going to say 5x times y squared. 
So it is a product rule that we have to deal with right here. So the product rule says take the derivative of the first, so that's 5, times it to the second, which is just y squared, plus the derivative of the second, so I bring the 2 down, leave the base just the way it is, lower the exponent by 1, so this becomes a power of 1, and then times by the derivative of the base, which is dy over dx, times the first, 5x. So there's the calculus aspect to this. Now we're trying to get dy over dx by itself, so let me clean this up just a little bit. So we got 1 equals a negative dy over dx plus 5y squared plus 2 times 5 is 10, so we got 10xy dy over dx. So you'll notice that this term here and this term here both have dy over dx's in them. This one does not, so let's get rid of it. Let's move it over here. So let's subtract both sides by 5, subtract both sides by 5y squared. So we got 1 minus 5y squared is equal to a negative 1 dy over dx, or just negative dy over dx, uh, plus 10xy dy over dx. Now both of these terms have dy over dx's in them, so let's factor that out, the dy over dx. And that leaves us with negative 1 plus 10xy. So now we're down to 1 dy dx, which is nice, other than not having those two anymore. So dy dx times this stuff right here. So to undo this stuff, we're going to, it's being multiplied, so we're going to divide. So our answer is going to be dy over dx is equal to 1 minus 5y squared divided by negative 1 plus 10xy. Kind of an ugly answer, but that's all right. It's just the way it is sometimes. So that's problem number 10. Both of those are implicit differentiation problems. Okay, salt fields, 11 and 12. So with a slope field, we're not graphing y over x. We're trying to graph the antiderivative. We're trying to graph the original equation for y. So what we're going to do is at each of these points, we're going to plug each of these points into this derivative, and it's going to give us a value. And that value is the slope of y at that point. And we're going to draw a little, a little segment of that slope. So for example, let's plug in 0, 0. If we plug in 0, 0, 0 on top, 0 on the bottom, 0 divided by 0 is undefined. I'm not going to do anything on this point. In fact, if x is 0, this whole thing is undefined. So all of these places here on the y-axis, x is equal to 0, we don't have to draw anything. That's nice. But if y is 0 and x is something other than 0, so if y is 0 and x is 1, for example, our 0 divided by 1 is 0, so our slope is 0. Here and at all these places, our slope is going to be 0. Well, let's try this point, 1, 1. So I plug in 1 for y, 1 for x. 1 over 1 is 1, so it's a slope of 1. 1 over 1, so it's like I'm drawing a line from this dot to that dot. So 1 over 1. Same thing will happen here at 2 and 2. will be 2 over 2, which is equal to 1. 3 over 3. Down here, negative 1 divided by negative 1 is positive 1, so it's going to have a positive 1 slope. Same here, same here. If we go to the other diagonal, Negative 1 is our y value. Negative 1 divided by 1 is negative 1. So this is going to have a negative 1 slope. And same thing over here. Let's try this point right here. So I plug in 2 for y and 1 for x. So 2 over 1 is 2. So this is going to have a slope of 2. So up 2 over 1. So if there was a dot right here, or if you notice this dot right here, that's also a slope of 2. I'm pointing towards the origin. So I'll draw a line towards the origin. Uh, this line right here, 3 over 1 is going to be 3, once again, towards the origin. You'll notice a pattern here that makes this problem really easy. Uh, 1 over 2, so 1 over 2 is a slope of 1 over 2, so I could go up 1 over 2, or I could go down 1 to the left 2, so it's like drawing a point, a line through this point to the origin. And as you go through all these problems, this is what your slope field is going to look like. And on this particular problem, this is not true for every problem, but the little pattern here is 
basically you're drawing a line from that point to the origin is what all these do which makes that that pattern makes it kind of nice to draw Be easier if I had a ruler but that's okay we'll make do All right, and there's our slope field. So there's our slope field for problem number 11. Okay, problem number 12. Uh, this time they give us a slope field, and we're trying to match the differential equation. We're trying to find the, we're trying to match this with what is produced over here. So let's see what we've got here. Notice that at x equals negative 1. So an x value of negative 1, there is no slope. So our equation has to be undefined if I plug negative 1 in for x, uh, notice they're all fractions, and so to make it undefined, the bottom would equal 0. So here, the, the denominator, if I plug in negative 1, I'm going to get a positive 1. So he's not right. He's not undefined. So I'm going to cross him off. Negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. He's not undefined. Ah, negative 1 plus 1, I like him. He is undefined at negative 1. Negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. He's not going to work. Ah, darn it, another one. Negative 1 plus 1, so I like, the, I like both of those guys. Next thing I notice that if x is equal to 2, my slope has to be equal to 0. So that means that if there are fractions, the numerator has to equal 0 if I plug in x value of 2. So 2 minus 2 is 0. Good, I like him again. Uh, and I like him as well. 2 minus 2 is also equal to 0. All right, let's find something else that will work. How about if x is equal to 3, Our slope has to be positive. Not much, but it is positive. So, so if we plug in 3 into these, it needs to be a positive value. So 2 minus 3, that's a negative value. 3 plus 1 is a positive. So I have a negative value by a positive. I don't like this guy. Plug in 3 here. 3 minus 2 is positive 1. 3 plus 1 is positive 4. So I have a positive. Divided by a positive is a positive. So I like this guy right here. Okay, problem number 13. This is another implicit differentiation problem. This time we're taking the second derivative. So we've got, let me write this out, cosine of y is equal to x. All right, derivative of cosine is negative sine, leave the inside alone, times by the derivative of the inside, which is dy over dx. Derivative of x with respect to itself is 1. So here's our first derivative. We're now done like calculating the first derivative. We just want to get the dy over dx by itself. It'll make the next step a little bit easier. So we're being times by negative sine y, so let's divide by negative sine y. And we get dy over dx is equal to 1 over negative sine of y. Now, you could look at this and say, OK, now we want to take the derivative again and use the quotient rule which would be just fine. However, if you're kind of quick on your feet, you notice 1 divided by sine is the same thing, or I should say negative 1 divided by sine, is the same thing as negative cosecant of y. Now, if you did not notice that, it's not the end of the world. You could still use the quotient rule, and you'll come up with the same answer. You just have lots of sines and cosines in it that you'll have to eventually change over to, apparently, looking at all the answers, cosecants and cotangents but you could. Or you can just do it right now and save yourself the, the heartache and trouble. So the derivative of dy over dx with respect to x is the second derivative of y with respect to x. The derivative of negative cosecant, well the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent, so the derivative of negative cosecant is going to be positive cosecant, leave the inside alone, cotangent, leave the inside alone, times the derivative of the inside, which is dy over dx. So this is our answer. And you'll notice, however, that none of the derivatives up here, or none of the answers up here have a dy over dx in it. So we need to get rid of that. Fortunately, we know what dy over dx is. It's negative cosecant of y. So the second derivative is equal to cosecant of y cotangent of y times dy over dx, which is negative cosecant of y. That gives us 
negative cosecant squared y cotangent of y, which is d. All right, problem number 14. Last problem. The volume of an expand, expanding sphere is increasing at a rate of 12 cubic feet per second. When the volume of the sphere is 36 pi cubic feet, how fast in square feet per second is the surface area increasing? So to, the key to this problem is recognizing what kind of a problem it is. It gives us a rate of change. We know that the volume is changing positively by 12 cubic feet per second. So our change in volume over the change in time per second, so change in time, is equal to 12. What we're trying to find is the change in surface area over change in time. So we're trying to find change in surface area over change in time. So when they give you a rate and you're trying to find another rate, this is a related rates problem. Somehow we want to write some equations that are going to help us relate these two rates. The other thing that we know is that the volume at the moment in time we want is 36 pi cubic feet. And you can put the units if you want. I'm lazy and I don't want to, um, but it probably wouldn't be a bad idea. If, if Miss Walter was listening to this, she'd be very upset at me for not putting the units. Uh, so here we go. So I need an equation that relates V with S. Well, I don't have one equation that has V and S in it, but I do have two equations up here that are related by R. So here's how R is related to V, and here's how R, the radius of our sphere, is related to S. So let's play around with those a little bit. Let's take a look at this equation right here. And let's get a dv out of, over dt out of it. So let's take the derivative of this with respect to t. Now just like on those implicit differentiation problems we did earlier, when we took the derivative of y with respect to x, we wrote it as dy over dx. v and r are not constants. They are unknowns. They are variables. So when I take the derivative of v with respect to t, I need to write it as dv over dt. All right, this is our variable right here. Everything else, is this is constant stuff, and that's an exponent. So this is a power rule. So I'm going to bring the 3 down. The 3's cancel out, or you can think of it as 12 divided by 3. It's going to give me 4 pi. Leave the inside alone. R squared times the derivative of the inside. So times dr over dt. Let's do the same thing over here with s. Let's take the derivative with respect to t. So we have... The derivative of s with respect to t is equal to 8 pi r to the first power times the derivative of the inside, so times dr over dt. All right, so now let's look what we've got. I know that this is equal to 12. And that's it. I don't know what dr over dt is. I don't know what r is. I don't know what ds over dt is, because that's what we're trying to find. Once again, r and dr over dt. So you'll notice I do know what this is. And you might think, well, what do we do now? Well, the other piece of information I haven't used yet is this right here. Volume. How is that helpful for finding something out here? Well, up here we've got, whoops, I forgot to save this as, or start working on a different layer. Sorry about that. I'm going to have to leave that there. Anyways, so we know that volume is equal to 4 thirds. I'll write it over here. 4 volume equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. If I know my volume is 36 pi, that has to equal 4 thirds pi r cubed. So I'll times both sides by 3, divide both sides by 4 pi, and we end up getting uh, 27 is equal to r cubed. That's what happens when you get the r cubed by itself. Divide both sides by pi, the pi's are gone. Divide by 4, you get 9, and then times by 3, you get 27. So take the cubic root of that, and we get 3 is equal to r. So our volume tells us that our radius is 3. So now I know that is 3, and I know this is 3. Well, over in this equation, the only unknown I have left is dr over dt. So if I just solve for dr over dt, I can take that value and plug it in over here. So let's do that now. So I've got, do this in green, I've got 12 is equal to 4 pi 3 squared times this dr over dt, the change in radius over change in time. Well, 3 squared is 9. 9 times 4 is 36. So I've got 12 equals 36 pi times dr over dt. 
Divide both by, sides by 36 pi, and we get 1 over 3 pi, 12 over 36 is 1 third, is equal to dr over dt. And now I can take that and plug it in here. And now the only unknown I have is the one I'm trying to solve for. So we have ds over dt is equal to 8 times pi times 3 times 1 third pi. 1 third, 1 over 3 pi, I should say. Well, the 3's cancel out, pi's cancel out, and we're left with 1 times 8. So the change in surface area over change in time is 8. All right, that does it for this video. I uh, hope it was uh, uh, useful. Um, yeah, thanks for watching.